you guys. Thank you so much, Ariel and Josh, for being with us. We have Ariel Gibbs and Josh Williams. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about them. So Ariel was raised in a small town in Illinois where she had early exposure to poverty, blatant racism, and structural inequalities. And she moved to San Diego in 2017. She completed a Master of Arts degree at San Diego State, and she was the organizer of the protest in solidarity that happened here in San Diego that um, triggered the string of protests that continue to take place here. So she's currently a district representative with a local state senator and also works to educate the community on politics and civic engagement. Joshua Williams is an engineer, a community activist, a mentor, and a former Division I athlete. He was born and raised in Inglewood and graduated from USD. And he's the founder and CEO of a nonprofit organization called Young Echelon. And they focus on developing a space to empower underserved youth through personal development and STEAM programming. So as leaders of this first organized protest, um, you know, first recently in the recent uh, Black Lives Matter movement, um, they soon realized that protesting was just the beginning of what they both passionately desired, and that was systemic change. So they believe that educating the people will empower the people. And that is why they are here today to share with us some ideas that they have about how we can get involved for the long run, not just, you know, showing up for protesting is great, but we know that we need to do more than that um, as we move forward to, to really create the change that we want to see. So welcome, Ariel and Josh. Thank you so much for the introduction, Stacy. That was amazing. And I can kind of speak for both uh, Josh and I. We are super excited. We've been excited this entire month. Um, for this presentation and we're excited for all of you to be here and just with an open mind and open heart to learn and want to participate in this movement. Um, so I'm kind of just going to start. Um, so for this month's theme of Insecure, uh, when I heard about it, um, the first thing I thought about was the show Insecure um, that Issa Rae, she's a writer, producer, and actress, and she's, you know, the main star of the show. Um, and this show actually just finished the season finale a couple weeks ago. And I don't want to spoil anything for anyone <laughs> that hasn't seen it um, or is interested in watching it because it's really, really good. But for those of you who have never heard of it um, or, you know, want a little bit more information about it, the show is kind of a premise on two black women in Los Angeles, California, and they deal with internal struggles within themselves and they touch on, you know, what happens in the black community. And, you know, being in their 20s, just like Josh and me, um, there are a ton of things that they're insecure about, right? And they have so many different awkward experiences in between. So, I think this was extremely relevant because, you know, right now I would say that we're very insecure of what's going on in our nation. And more importantly, we're insecure about um, the entire movement that's taking, taking uh, place in our nation. So uh, let's actually go back a little bit and touch on the protest that uh, both Josh and I are extremely involved with. So... If I'm honest, uh, last month was an extremely tough time for the black community and very specifically for me, like full on, right? After I watched the shooting of Ahmaud Arbery, and I wouldn't even say a shooting, he was hunted as a black man while he was jogging in a neighborhood. I personally fell into a very, very deep depression. I, it was very hard for me to get out of bed. It was really hard for me to, you know, do anything. It was hard for me to report to work and be expected to put on this face that everything was okay when it really wasn't, you know, and me being a black woman and having, you know, black brothers, um, having a black father, having black relatives and, you know, seeing even Josh, we're not blood related, but this is my brother. 
seeing something like that really shook my core. And so, you know, from all of that, we were faced with yet another black man being murdered on camera. And that was with George Floyd. So with George Floyd, it's still to this day really hard for me to talk about because, you know, he was a father. He was an honored man in his community. And there was something about watching that video that literally shook my soul to its core. And of course, as I mentioned with Ahmaud Arbery and many of you who might know my background from reading um, my bio, you know, I've seen, and we've all seen black men and women victimized by police brutality over these years. Terrence Crutcher, Eric Gardner, Sandra Bland, Laquan McDonald, just to name a few. And there's an entire list of those, right? But there was something specifically about this video, again, a few weeks later after Maude Arbery, we watched a black father, a black man, beg for his mother and desperately whisper, I can't breathe, to an officer that kneeled with his hands in his pockets as he put pressure on his neck. And I feel that everyone, everyone was affected by watching someone slowly lose their life like that. So after I kind of was processing, it was, it was very overwhelming for me at the time. Um, I, you know, was struggling already and to see yet another video. And of course, many videos that happened in between and news that happened in between and after, I transitioned my grief stages um, from depression to rage and just pure anger. Now, I'm not from San Diego. I'm from Illinois, as Stacy mentioned. And I came to uh, San Diego right after living in Chicago for four years. So, you know, I have a lot of roots and, of course, a lot of friends and family back in Illinois and back in Chicago specifically. And I watched Chicago kind of protest for their justice as they, you know, um, are very active in speaking out about police brutality just because of the culture um, with the Chicago Police Department. It runs extremely deep. But I almost immediately wondered to that point, what's San Diego doing, right? So again, being not from here, I realized there were a lot of questions about what is San Diego doing or what are we doing to protest? And everyone was asking, I was seeing it all over on social media, you know, on Facebook pages, everything else, but no one was really taking the steps to plan anything. And, you know, I, I got a little bit impatient, not a little bit, a lot of bit impatient, right? Um, so, I kind of posted on a page uh, of local black women in San Diego and I asked them, hey, do you guys know anything about a protest going on this weekend? If not, I wanna plan something because I'm, I don't wanna sit and wait anymore in silence. So I, I got a few you know, inboxes of individuals who wanted to help, but there was one individual who reached out to me um, and she was very active, you know, in wanting to ask how exactly can I help or what exactly do we need to do to make sure that we generate this movement, right? So I took the initiative of making a flyer about the protest and I said, okay, well, let's organize something on Sunday. We can meet downtown, um, you know, the Hall of Justice is a great space um, for us to kind of be central and, you know, march around the city so that we can have our voices be heard to the community of the city of San Diego. Now, this was one of the first protests um, from the entire movement, but it was the first protest in the city of San Diego post George Floyd video, right? Um, so as soon as I made that flyer, I reached out to local community leaders and I let them know, hey, I'm, I'm organizing this protest and I would appreciate you kind of reaching out and uh, to your organizations or to your uh, movements here and so that we can uh, start organizing it and get people going. 
And, you know, within that group, I definitely reached out to my local RISE fellow, Joshua Williams. And, you know, we kind of got together and really started to push these things. I actually, I can jump in right there. First and foremost, thank you for your strength, sis, to want to start something like this and being having the courage to step out of your insecurities and um, utilize your voice, your uh, your resources to really organize something that needed to happen. Um, much like Ariel, the the coming months leading up to George Floyd definitely being um, on quarantine, COVID, and trying to like navigate this space. Um, and seeing these different videos come out, you know, of what's going on with Breonna Taylor, what's going, what happened to Ahmaud Aubrey, as, as a Black man, like, I'm shook to my core by that, you know? And I'm trying to navigate, you know, what should I do? Because if you, like, recount and go back, this is not something that's brand new. Me growing up in Inglewood, California, um, one of the first things you hear about uh, growing up out there is what happened with Rodney King and the overly use of police force and, and his beating back in 91, you know? And so whenever I interact with cops, it's that's something that's playing in my mind that like, that could easily be my life. You know, that could easily be something that is escalated um, that quickly, you know? And in past, in past um, experience in protests, like back in 2015 uh, for Mike Brown, 2012 with Trayvon Martin, I was, I was a kid, I was a young man back then, but like now coming into myself, having this stability, I can stand idly by um, and just continue to watch these in injustices occur without doing something active in this moment to really be a part of the change that I want to see um, that our people def definitely need. Um, and so once Ariel hit me up and said, hey, yo, I'm, I'm, what are you doing Sunday? I think it was the Friday before the protest. She was like, what are you doing Sunday? She was like, going to the protest? My what protest? She was like, well, I'm putting together this protest. And I'm like, well, hey, yo, if you're about it, let's be about it. Um, and not really knowing what my role was going to be in that, just knowing that I needed to be present and be there. Um, and first, most just supportive, one of my strong black sisters who is having the courage to, to um, take up this mantle. Um, but once it began, it's like when I quickly uh, found my voice, because in my past, I've always led by example. It's something that I wanted to be at the, not so much in the forefront, but be a part of any type of organization and like be in a leadership role to help kind of push that change. And so once uh, the protests actually were done, just kind of touching on that experience real quick, which was such a transformative moment for me uh, personally and a lot of people out there. Um, once we met at the Hall of Justice, Ariel said her piece, kind of got everybody riled up and then we started walking. and. She, she was charged up using her voice, uh, starting, starting chants. And I'm like, she's going to burn out if somebody doesn't really step up and support it. You know, so that inspired me to, like, kind of lift up my voice and help, you know, kind of guide this crowd and, like, navigate um, through downtown San Diego to really have our voices be heard. You know, um, just touching on the importance of protests, you know, because people usually go to, like, the looting, the rioting, and not really understand what a protest is for. Dr. King said it best, uh, protest is the, is the voices of the, unhor of the unheard, you know, and over the, the generations, you take it back to the 60s, like, people have been preaching these same things for these same civil liberties for far too long that are plaguing the Black community, but not just our community, communities all around, you know, Black and Brown see it the worst, but now it's something that we can do in this moment to be about the change. You know, and so we, we progressed down. I wanted to go down Little Italy uh, because um, one of the things that was kind of sickening to me is that people were just out having brunch this Sunday morning like it's another day in America. And it's like, how can you just sit idle by and just allow this to continue to happen when I know you saw the same video that I saw, you know? And, and, I, and I admit, it can be super desensitizing when you, you can become desensitized when you see um, injustices like this happen so frequently. And I, the, the aspect of, of uh, George Floyd actually being killed, that wasn't what shocked me. That, that's not what really shook me to my core. It's like, because I've seen it so many times. Um, kind of branching off of what Ariel said, seeing the, the ease and the relaxedness of the officers uh, kneeling on his back with his hands in his pockets, that's what really shook me when he had three other people there. So they had it under, they had the situation under control. George Floyd was already 
handcuffed. And so knowing that that is going on and you had the control, like there was no need for that man to lose his life that day. You know, and if we don't stand up and come together, that is going to continue to happen, you know. And so navigating through, a, through the protests and kind of being one of the leaders, uh, kind of picking the, 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 the route and where to go, um, it, was, it was a beautiful thing to be a part of just because you saw so many different people from so many different backgrounds there in solidarity for, for the same cause, you know, and really wanting to make, uh, be a part of the change um, that, you, that, that we all want to see. You know, we had a moment of silence in front of the, uh, uh, the county building down there where we all took a nail in the street off of Harbor Boulevard, which was just kind of beautiful. And as we progressed, you just saw our numbers grow. We started with maybe 200 people. Within the first two hours, it was, it was in the thousands. And for so many people having that call to action so rapidly, that's how I know that I was in the place that I needed to be in that moment that we all were in the place that we needed to be in that moment. And that is something that I kind of echoed in any of the speeches that I gave while I was out there. Um, and there, there came a point in, in the protest where we're like, okay, what do we do next? You know, um, where, where do we go from here? And so I was thinking of that in two ways, one in that moment, but also kind of moving forward. How do we take this momentum and transition that into something that is going to be lasting change uh, for our people, you know, and, one moment I want to touch on before I get to that transition is that we had to take another knee before we were planning to take the, the freeway to really allow our voices to be heard. Because if we're stopping traffic, people are going to know what's going on. I'm, I was proud to send Diego for rising to that occasion and walking with us to, to, to join the, the world, join the nation um, in, in solidarity to really echo the call um, for justice. And, I want to touch on, touch on the over-militarization of, like, police force and how dangerous and quickly that could escalate because that did what things kind of led to later on. And after we took a knee and we're, we, we rallied our, our group and we're going to go take the freeway, I know one of the officers, there was a motorcycle cop kind of progressing with us. He heard what we were going to be doing, so he echoed that to, to – to, to his friends and all that stuff, the people, the other policemen. And next thing you know, after we had a, a peaceful moment of like just kneeling and just coming together, you see pretty much SWAT teams, military grade equipment forming up behind us three blocks away. And up until this moment, all we did was walk in, and voice our First Amendment right, right? And to see that turn around, I, I, I legitimately paused and I'm like, you know what? No, it's not, this is not what we're doing. Everybody kneel back down. You know, this is we're here peacefully protesting, but they're ready to bring out the cavalry. So while they're from up over there, let's go our own way. And I'm trying to get everybody to realize that there's a better way than using force to, to get your point across, to de de-escalate a situation. You know, because usually that force is going to escalate that situation. And so I'm not just talking to the people because the people can show, talk about Colin Kaepernick. We know how to peacefully protest. We know how to... Uh, to 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 alter ourselves and humble ourselves to try to get a message across but what do you do when every time you try a different method that uh de-escalation tactic you're met with force you know and so i really as we continue our discussion i really want you to think of that um and i'm gonna pass it back to my sis ariel yes and of course the protest was definitely something Oh, I thought they were coming for me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, so I think that the protest was definitely um, an awakening for a lot of San Diego. Um, and I think that the one thing that is so inspiring about this entire movement is that although um, Josh and I and other individuals got you know, detached from the group at some point, like we've been protesting for five hours. Um, we'd gotten separated from the larger core of the group, but they met back at the Hall of Justice. Um, and as we were kind of watching what was going on, these two young girls, they were, they were white young individuals. Um, they said they were 19 and 20. They were sprinting uh, after the tear gas was first administered um, in the crowd for the peaceful protest. They mentioned that they were kneeling in the front lines by officers and they were perceived to uh, be kicked in the face, 
um, need in the face and then further cast. Um, and of course, this was extremely disheartening to me because not only did we go out there to be peaceful and met with, you know, the militarization of the police officers who were supposed to be there to protect our rights to peacefully protest, right? They definitely were met with, you know, this surge of violence that we weren't there for. But I say it's inspiring because although these young women were there um, and they were met with violence, we saw a string of protests that happened after. And it honestly, you know, enlightened me. It made me push even more for this passion of change. And I had to ask myself, why are people still protesting? And my specific ask, and I know a lot of other specific asks for, you know, being heard is this entire ideology and this entire uh, reality of systemic racism and oppression. So what is systemic racism, right? There are systems put in place to create and perpetuate inequality for minorities and people of color. And I can't teach you literally everything there is to know about systemic racism and oppression. And, you know, I've taken a ton of graduate seminar classes on race. I've, I've lived race. And it's just really hard to wrap your mind around it, especially in the 20 minutes that we have. Um, it's even hard to learn it in 16 weeks when you do a graduate seminar or you take a class on these sorts of things or when you grow up around it and you're not a, a black person or person of color. Like it, it's really hard to understand sometimes. But the reality is it exists in so many of our systems. And I think that the biggest system that we're all kind of protesting for is the system of criminal justice or really law enforcement, right? We have this entire history of law enforcement being created to police slaves because slaves were property. We weren't people, we weren't human beings. We were a sub of you know, what was going on in America. Although we put in the work, we, we generated the economy, you know, we don't have, we didn't have any sort of the opportunities or the equality that was, you know, generated on what this country is supposed to be about. And that system has perpetuated itself over time. It has not gone anywhere. They always find a way to recreate the wheel. So slavery ended, we've got the Jim Crow laws. We, we were sharecroppers, we've got the Jim Crow, Crow laws. You know, after the Jim Crow laws and we've gotten into civil rights, we still see systemic racism. We see our children, black children and, and children of color in our school systems that are not only over-policed, but they're also put into systems that aren't given the equal education, uh, equal educational rights, right? We, we have underperforming schools and schools that do not get the equal funding uh, that they need. In addition, we have the mass incarceration system or the prison industrial complex. We have laws that are systemically created to criminalize the black and brown individuals, such as gang documentation laws. In my opinion, I, I wrote my entire thesis and my master's program on gang documentation and how unconstitutional it is because we do have the right to assemble. Um, and if a gang member is committing crimes, they're responding to a system of oppression. And that's exactly what, these are the types of things, it's not the only thing, but it's the types of things of our this racist system being perpetuated and just reinventing the wheel. They'll always find a way to kind of um, re-encompass like this, this system that is putting on the value of the American dream when everyone doesn't have the opportunity to achieve that. And so my personal experience is in education. And of course, I've been in academia for six years, <laughs> undergrad and graduate school. And honestly, I have, I like to say uh, now at this point that I almost have a degree in black plight, right? I've generated all of these research studies and research and read and been a part of academic conversations that are about racial oppression and systemic racism. And it's so challenging 
to have that as a part of my background because it's so, you know, it, it's just so deep. And my research is only making a very small footprint and a very small impact mm. on how large this system is. And that's my personal experience. Chiming in on that, um, there's a couple of great things she, she touched on, definitely when it comes to systemic racism. Um, I want to talk about real quick, just one of the perpetuations that probably really spawned in the 80s underneath the, the Reagan administration for the current a view of what police are actually looking like in terms of a military force. So in the 80s under the Reagan administration, there's this, um, there was a war on drugs, you know, that was one of his, his huge, his huge pushes, you know, and so from that, um, spawned a, a program called the, uh, uh, the 1033 program, which pretty much any leftover military grade equipment police officers on the mainland have to access to actually utilize those. So assault rifles, um, helicopters, Humvees, like all, all these the, the grenade launchers. And so now we're equipping our police force who was here to pretty much mediate, um, mediate um, altercations for the people that they're serving, you know, on the home front. But now they're, they're, they, they've gained this kind of resource that if you, there's studies that actually show um, and that when they have that type of uh, artillery in their arsenal, that you know you get this kind of fear complex, which they want when they walk into to, um, a situation, you know, to be able to u utilize that force to actually have people almost cower. But like that's not what the ideal of what the police officer on the mainland was ever came from. But that's what it's wanting to. So I do urge you to go look a little bit more into the 1033 program and what goes into that and what access we're giving to um, our officers um, and how easily that now having an assault rifle versus a baton, there's gonna be a lot more bodies that are dropping on a daily basis, you know? Um, and then kind of just chiming back into like my personal experience and kind of things that I have been doing prior to you know, George Floyd and the protests and then the kind of transitioning now is that, you know, my background is in engineering, you know, and so I take things from a very logical project management perspective, you know, really want to scale it, you know, so give me, give me a problem and then like, let's reverse engineer the solution. And so I see what's going on with police brutality as a huge problem, you know, but that's only a small aspect. If you go back into what Ariel was talking about, systemic racism, and see how deeply rooted all this is in with the, within the fabric of our, our system, we really do need to take a step back and like scale everything out, put everything on paper, and then because everybody has a job to do because it's so it's such an abundance uh, thing that needs to come from, and then start now allocating our forces to dismantle the system that is set to have to oppress people, to oppress black people, but oppress people of color, you know. Um, and until we do that, we're never going to see a lasting change. We have this momentum. You can't, nobody can plead willful ignorance anymore because social media, it's legitimately the knowledge is at our fingertips, you know? And so it's, what are you going to do with that? You know, for me, I, I, I really find value in going back in um, mentoring youth to give them understandings and exposures to things that I didn't have growing up, but that once I was exposed to it, you know, later on in my life and in my career, I can see the benefit of that. But knowing that you can have access to that at an earlier age so you can be a bigger contender, a lot of what you gain from white privilege from having that generational wealth and that generational knowledge and that general understanding of your history. You know, so one of the biggest eye openers for me after all this and being involved is like, there's a lot more that I need to go back and learn about my history. There's a lot of things that I need to be educated on to be able to then give that back to the community that I serve. You know, and then also having these 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 crucial conversations. But I'm not up here giving my testimony just to like make people feel good and or anything like that. That's not my premise behind it at all. So let me just clear that up. The reason why we're here, the reason why we want to utilize this platform is to build bridges, to uh, to make connections, to really dismantle the system that is at place. You know, and so I value everybody's participation here today and your willingness to be a part of this conversation, but we're gonna give you some um, resources of what roles um, are out there that we, we see and we find value in filling, um, but also yourself. Do your research and see what you can become passionate about about this movement, because I guarantee you there is something that you can do. The one thing that I really wanna to touch on beforehand that was a huge eye-opener for me, yesterday I had the opportunity to be interviewed by a fifth grader, a, fifth, uh, a little fifth grade, uh, 
uh, a white kid. And one of my colleagues said, hey, you know, my friend is doing a project on, um, on, on racism in the, in the Black Lives Matter movement. You mind talking to him knowing my involvement um, in the protests and everything? And in my mind, I'm like, absolutely. Let, let's, let's do it, no problem. And so I, I don't even think I was really ready for what these, these, this kid was about to ask me. Um, but the very first question, like after he said hello, his mom kind of popped off the conversation. And he was like, um, what was the question? He said, what do you think causes racism? You know, in my first reaction, even though I have a long list of what I feel causes racism, was to shade him from the reality of the world. And that's because that's how I've been conditioned to like not really allow kids or me as a kid to like learn what really went on. You know, and to to then have a more informed um, informed perspective on how to proceed. You know, so I really shout out to Van. I really thank you for asking me these questions. You know, and kind of putting it in perspective, and even being open to learn and to educate yourself, and then do something different, like leading a protest at your elementary school. You know, and so if if a fifth grader can understand who had who was so far removed, who understands racism but never actually had seen it. What can we do now to make sure that he doesn't actually see that in his future? You know, how can we dismantle and abolish racism in a, in, in a manner that the kids that are jaded and, and, and doesn't see this, that we can do something active to prevent them from actually seeing the type of injustices that we all have witnessed or been a part of in our lives. So I urge you to kind of really put that into perspective as you kind of proceed to take up your mantle. Of course, thank you. And so, of course, the most important part of this to all of us, are, to both Josh and I, is to really educate you guys on the next steps that you can take. And, not, and also kind of like take in what we're saying, but also be about, you know, why exactly you're sitting here and why you're learning these things, right? And I feel that a lot of us, in, especially in the chats and, you know, a lot of us here right now, are definitely passionate and want to be able to make this change. So we need to begin to kind of uh, imagine what the criminal justice system looks like as a form of the systemic racism and the deep roots of racism in general. So it's not easy to imagine what this looks like by any means. And I, you know, have two degrees and I've studied criminal justice and all of this, but it's even hard for me. Um, and we have so many resources right now, like the internet is a blessing and almost a curse, right? Because there's just so many different things. There's all these panel discussions, there's campaigns and outlined agendas, and we have an abolition agenda, and we have, you know, a defund the police agenda, and there's so many things that we're, it's almost sometimes overwhelming um, of the types of things that are out there, right? Um, but one thing that's for sure is that if you don't understand police brutality, I definitely have a resource to share that uh, will show you exactly what's going on with our um, police department right now. And if you don't live in San Diego, this is actually a perfect resource for you to go to um, and look up your own city, especially in uh, the and police department in the uh, state of California. So this is actually a resource called the policescorecard.org. Um, and it goes through and it talks about all police brutality in this is the city of San Diego's uh, police department. And it has a depth of information about, you know, what exactly is going on, the list of complaints, uh, crimes committed by police officers, what have they done to kind of help uh, mitigate these issues, right? So I definitely encourage everyone to go here and look at their own police jurisdictions to find out what exactly is going on with your police department and see and kind of put that reality towards what is happening with our nation, right? Because sometimes it's really hard to focus on the movement and focus on the fact that these things are happening in our communities when, you know, it's not our community on tape, on World Star, or on, you know, the media circulating as uh, an issue around the nation, right? So I definitely want everyone to kind of uh, view that as a resource. And then we also have a ton of other things, right? So I've actually uh, joined with a coalition of legislative uh, workers in the Capitol. And uh, I've also kind of uh, been 
we've been co in a coalition of young black millennials um, in San Diego, and we're compiling this entire resource of uh, local bills that are uh, geared towards an agenda of making law enforcement a lot better for black and brown individuals and people of color in general. So um, I won't share them all with you, but a great resource um, is that we're trying to, uh, so there's ACA 6, which was a uh, bill that was voted on in the Senate and the Assembly very recently that actually voted to restore voting rights for parolees and individuals released them from prison. So it's definitely really, really important that we get, restore these rights to individuals, voting rights and other things, right? So that we can kind of generate a conversation and also, you know, give these individuals the power of the voice, right? Um, there's a ton of different other resources as far as bills, but I definitely want to make sure that I share with you as we're running out of time, um, the Independent Commission on Police Accountability, uh, which is uh, footed by the San Diegans for Justice. And essentially the premise of this is that it establishes independent commission with subpoena powers that would represent, that would be represented by legal counsel separate from the city. So it basically allows in, independent investigations of all officer involved shootings and officer related deaths. And we need this in San Diego. We need the community's input and to kind of stop this uh, secrecy and this non-transparency in our police departments to understand what's going on and get justice for these individuals and keep fighting for you know this equality and another resource i want to share with you guys is the police accountability now which is like a five-point agenda that addresses police accountability and we definitely want to urge you all to reach out to your local elected officials to implement these changes by calling them or submitting letters. Um, and this is actually a plan footed by Mid City Can and the ACLU. And their points very briefly um, talk about so uh, one of their points is, you know, ban the use of consent searches and limit discretionary stops by passing the preventing over policing through equitable community treatment. Uh, they would like to stop law enforcement of uh, low level offenses and invest in non law enforcement interventions. Um, so for example, responding to mental health crises and things like that. And I know we've had movements um, here with the county, but we definitely want to keep pushing for the city. Um, and in addition, uh, strengthening community oversight to ensure accountability, adopt a robust de-escalation process, which we've mentioned a lot before, and enact strong use of force policies, um, which uh, is we've seen with the eliminating ban hole, uh, banning, sorry, chokeholds and carotid restraints, and requiring a duty to intervene and in instituting other measures. So these are definitely resources that the community is welcome to um, Look, tap into and get those resources and we're here to encourage everyone and of course if you need more information both of us are open to receive that definitely um that was a wealth of information um take your time to process it um one thing i do want to touch on is just kind of like just the mental health of everything that's going on right now it's overwhelming it's overwhelming sometimes for me for ariel for for somebody who's trying to learn about it and so know that this is a movement that is going on, that is going to continue, you know, with or without you, but knowing, also knowing that, that it's okay to take a breath, you know? And so that's why we felt it was so important to get a part of these different coalitions that are now creating infrastructures to keep this conversation going and also start implementing change, you know, in the voting booths, you know, to like really attack the policy, you know, to really have that long lasting change for the next generation. Um, so just know that it's a marathon, not a sprint. Shout out Nipsey. Um, but we're all in this together and being a part of the solution is being a part of the healing. You know, Ki uh, uh, Kendrick uh, Sampson from Insecure that we touched on earlier, that's something that he said when he was out protesting in LA, you know, and so there's a lot of content out here. And so let's, let us do our part to kind of find our role in it all. And I know we've been kind of talking for a minute, but I really want to hear from you guys and what questions you may have for us that we can kind of um, deliberate on right now. Um, and, and field for you guys, you, you guys, you men and women. Um, so yeah, I wanna open it back up to, to our host to kind of mediate that portion of the dialogue. Can we first, I know we can't clap uh, and we can't all hear claps, but um, 
Thank you both so much. Um, this is a really powerful conversation. And um, I just appreciate and admire their create, your courage um, and your humility in all this. And just want to say thank you, um, first and foremost. So I know it's about 10 o'clock. We're going to go long. So if you're still with us, um, we're still going to do about a 15-minute Q&A. Um, and so I'd encourage you to stick around if you can um, uh, and um, be part of that. So um, as far as questions and answers, before how we've done that is you should uh, have the ability to raise your hand um, down on the lower bar of your Zoom. Uh, you should have the ability to raise your hand. Um, I believe, uh, maybe get confirmation in the chat. Um, Yes, uh, Angie, I was about to cry, so I appreciate you noticing that when I said thank you. Thanks to everybody in the chat that uh, caught that. Um, I did earlier, but uh, anyways, no, uh, I do feel this, guys. I think that that's the thing. Like, it, like, I think we all have to acknowledge that we don't, like, this is a ton to feel. And I just, uh, I, like, Ariel and Josh, like, again, just I cannot thank you enough for being willing to uh, share your perspective with us. So, anyways, as far as, um, as, far as uh, raising your hand, I think you should have, we already have some, some people with their hands up. So, um, Mike, I'm going to go ahead and let you unmute people uh, as you see fit, um, or I can, um, if you want me to, just tell me which one you'd, you'd prefer. Yeah, it looks like MJ has a question. So I'd right. love to uh, hear from her. Perfect. Hey guys, um, I really appreciate you taking the time to step up and break things down for people. And I really appreciate you being transparent and, uh, and understanding in this weird time where we're all in different places on our journey. Um, for me, I, I shared that struggle with finding the protest, finding the places in San Diego. I came from Chicago where people use their voice, man. People step up. You hear them, you know, like, so as a white individual with privilege and recognizing that, how can we step up or organize protests where we can give black individuals or people of color the platform uh, with a respectful and empowering way? Like, I, I definitely want to be a part of something, but I'm having a hard time finding stuff. I, I don't know if organizing something myself or finding a group to organize with, like what would be the proper way, proper channel to go about that in your opinion? So honestly, I don't think as of right now, it's a, it's a, it is a proper way because it's such uncharted territories um, for everyone. And, but I could tell you some of the things that I have seen, you know, I had an old teacher who, you know, she created a coalition for, for white women to be anti-racist and have conversations get around this, you know. Um, there's people who, like, when we're out of the protests, like, there was a huge population of, of white people standing in solidarity in that moment, you know. And so it'll look differently. I guess the bigger thing that I would say to you is just try it and see what type of response you get. And, and it's going to take – you're going to be insecure about it. It's going to take some courage to, like, actually – enter into that, you know, but the more you're putting yourself out there and open, there's going to be people that receive you. And I'm not going to say everybody's going to be willing to receive you, but somebody will. And then using that momentum to then continue to build upon, you know, but it really kind of just starts with like making an attempt, you know, looking at maybe some of the resources uh, that Ariel just kind of sent out to everyone um, and seeing if that's something that you can uh, jump onto because there, I know there are things and programs and organizations that are already doing the work and so seeing which one correlates most with your value on this actual on, on the topic of Black Lives Matter and then you can maybe commit some time and some and some of your resources to that as well. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I definitely wouldn't feel shy in, you know, wanting to have your voice heard. And the biggest mantra that both Josh and I have get, been pushing on these platforms is that this is a movement and, you know, the system wasn't built in a day, so we definitely can't deconstruct it in a day. But we do need all hands on deck. So my whole, literally our mantra is whatever your role is, pick it and play it to the best of your ability like go hard for it so if you want to go out and protest I've, i'd be more than happy to you know help coordinate things i don't know if i'm going to be protesting for a while because i literally lost my voice for four days <laughs> and, it, and it really bothered me <laughs> but you know 
if, if you want help in, you know, getting your message out, I can definitely connect you with our um, Black Millennial Agenda team. We have a coalition of local Black young leaders um, who are part of the Black Lives Matter San Diego and the Black Women's March and other uh, organizations and things. So I can definitely connect you with those individuals and we can start something going because I definitely don't want to, you know, silence this momentum at all but thank you for wanting to participate we definitely appreciate the allyship and just wanting to uh put, keep pushing the movement thanks mj um lindsay i'm gonna go ahead and unmute you for your question can you hear me we can yes. okay awesome i'm in the car so it's safe so i can't see anything um but <laughs> I wanted to uh, ask a question um, to the speaker. Thank you so much for sharing, but um, I'm Jewish. And so um, it's really hard for me to see other Jewish people who are against it, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, or more for the All Lives Matter movement, which is shocking to me because of all the persecution that we've faced throughout the centuries. And I would love to know your thoughts on how you handle people like Candace Owens and other uh, people like that who maybe have a different agenda and any tools that you're able to use to maybe first see them as a person because I'm having a hard time of um, seeing these people as people who don't understand. And so any insight you have into that would be great. Thank you. Mary, you want to go? You want me to take it? <laughs> <laughs> That's such an amazing question. Thank you for asking, Lindsay. I feel like that question comes across a lot, especially when you're trying to find where exactly you fit in the movement um, as an ally, right? So I think that something that we have in our community and a saying that we have in our community is skin folk ain't kin folk. And what that means is just because somebody looks like you, or maybe you guys are, you know, together on something does not mean that we represent the same thing, nor do I want to be associated with you, right? So when it comes to people like Candace Owens or even Ben Carson or the people that are talking these, these just random, ridiculous ideologies about Black individuals, one, they don't understand the historical context of what systemic oppression means, and they don't understand what exactly it means to um, be Black, I would say. They have a lot of self-hate for what they have gone through or, or however that exists. Um, so they definitely don't speak for me. And two, I also try to kind of ignore those things because although they have a uh, larger platforms, I don't want to be associated with anyone that is not ready to facilitate change at all. I'm here for people who, you know, want to make a difference in the world, to foster policy changes, to encourage others to vote, to make sure that we're all on a, a, a certain platform of equality or really equity because we're kind of mm. behind in all of this. Um, so, you know, it, it's, I understand that it's really hard to exist while these people are talking, but I choose not to associate with them and I try my best not to even pay attention when I see that stuff on my feed because people do share it. I'm deleting that person. You know, you're not part of my agenda. And you know, if you're, if you're about a black person or any person being killed by police over a $20 bill or a $2 loose cigarette, or sleeping in my car when I'm inebriated and the police were called and I was shot in the back because I was sleeping in my car, even though I begged you to take me to my sister's house down the street. If you're standing for that, then I don't wanna be associated, associated with you, period. Piggybacking real quick, cause that, she, she said everything that, and I, I agree fully. But one of like the mantras that sounds like prayers that I, I really like hold dear to my heart is uh, the serenity prayer. You know, Lord, grant me the serenity, accept, accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. You know, and so I've, I've been able to apply that in so many different facets of my life. But like directly with the, with the question that you ask is that, one, you can't change, you can't change everybody's mind. You're gonna have to be, be able to pick your battles. If somebody's coming from a place where they don't actually wanna learn and don't wanna understand, it's like, you're gonna, you're gonna be preaching to, to a tree. And at that point, you just have to recognize that like, all right, you might have to do it without them. And that's okay. Cause you, you don't have, you can't save everyone, but 
there will be a lot more people out there who's willing to hear what you have to say when it's about justice and it's about doing things for, for black people and like just these civil human rights that we're asking for, um, for starters. Um, and then so I'll say like now redirect that energy that you have to like maybe talking to that tree to now talking to somebody else that will align and, and willing to ally with your message and your mission and what you're trying to accomplish. You know, because like we said before, the movement is going to continue with or without the people who want to kind of hop on board. And so if you if you team up with the people who are really about the change and about uh, combating this, this systemic uh, racism that uh, is plaguing our nation, then you're, you're going to be able to find an avenue to really be a part of the healing. Thank you, Lindsay, for the question. That was awesome. And thank you for the responses. That was also awesome. I'm going to stop talking to trees, that's for sure. So appreciate <laughs> that. Um, hey, uh, anybody else with a question, uh, please raise your hand. Or if you're not comfortable uh, uh, asking your question specifically, feel free to post a question in the comments. I'm happy to read them to our speakers. Any other questions? I'll give it about 15 seconds to see if we get some. Oh, here we go. Rich, I'm going to unmute you. You're uh, unmuted. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, being so giving of your time and your energy today. I really appreciate that. Um, my question for you is something that I've been asking myself lately, too, is what do you do when you feel like you're getting close to burnout? How do you mm. unplug? That's a great question. I think that, at least for me, um, I haven't reached my burnout point yet. And I haven't really felt that I'm close to burnout. Literally, I, I, as I said before, I literally feel like I have my degree in black light. <laughs> I just became like this super radical individual when I was an undergrad and I was in Chicago. I wrote all these research, 20 page research papers all the time uh, and just applying black light to like a ton of different things, right? And you know, for me, it's also the little changes that I see that motivates me and uh, presses me to keep going, right? So we had the ban of carotid restraints. We have now the Office on Equity and Racial Justice in the County of San Diego. We have all of these uh, legislative, these legislative uh, bills pass in both the Senate and the Assembly in the state of California. And just viewing that policy and being able to be a part of that has kind of just kept me motivated. Um, and when I do feel a little bit fatigued, I begin to just surround myself by like-minded individuals because we all just kind of face that fatigue at different moments. Um, so I, I definitely try to, you know, my co the coalition of the young black millennials um, that I mentioned before, they're an extremely helpful resource to me, especially our weekly meetings are really, really helpful um, in just recentering and refocusing. I talk with Josh almost every day, all day about things. And, you know, we kind of feed off of each other's energy to keep this momentum going and not just because of the name of the movement, but also because, you know, we're black and we still have to live it even when it's not a hashtag. So I definitely feel like, you know, just recharging with other individuals who are like-minded or kind of have that same um, push as you um, is really helpful in trying to uh, defeat that fatigue. Yeah. And similarly, I'm somebody who's motivated by my passions. Like, and so, because I feel so strongly about what's going on right now, like definitely when you see something accomplished or you you get a response from somebody like thank you for speaking up like that that's giving me fuel honestly um, because I know somebody needs to do it and when it does come to a moment where I just need a breath I'll just take that breath you know if I need to go on a walk walk my dog you know go look at the ocean to recharge something to just take my mind off of things you know, to like then be able to now continue to troubleshoot and critically think and um, be innovative about how we can go about this movement and how can we, we cause change. It's just like understanding that um, it's okay to pause. Mm -hmm. um, but I think my life leading up to this point has been conditioning, conditioning me for this moment um, in particularly, you know, whether it was um, creating an organization in, in, in college for uh, black engineers, NSBE you know, to offer them resources to, uh, for professional development and, and, and things of, of that such. It was all little things to like, now if you're trying to organize on a larger scale for the community and the nation at large, you know, it's, you've, it's things you've already been doing, you know? And so um, it's just really kind of taking the time and putting yourself around people who are gonna kind of give you energy and kind of fuel you and not tear you down. Um, and that's super important. 
Thank you for the question. Great question. Uh, Charles has a question. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Charles. Hi. Um, I, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. All right. Um, so my question is, um, that I feel like we're all taking, uh, trying to do some actions, but how do we actually create impact with our actions so they're, they're more impactful? How do we, um, yeah, so can you answer, maybe give us a couple ideas on that? Yeah, so first I'll say growth comes at the edge of your own comfort zone. Um, and knowing that, that if, you, if you're feeling like tension, are you feeling tense from the work that you're doing definitely along this agenda, like you're probably going to be on the right path because you're, you're trying to create something new. Um, and the impact is something that it, it can't be a one-time thing. You know, um, if, you, if you see injustice or like you see somebody kind of being racist and you're not calling it out in that moment, you know, but continually every single time, like then it's just going to uh, uh, phase out. You know, impact is, is a conditioning. And so recognizing that's a conditioning and like you can't just do a one-time donation and feel like, oh, well, I just helped change the world. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lifelong process. Um, and I know that can be intimidating, but in reality, it's like, it's, it's what's needed to really make the lasting change. And to have a little bit more of a, a tangible answer too for you, Charles, um, I would say that to get involved with a lot of the organizations that I mentioned, reach out to Mid City Can to see how you can impact their police accountability now um, movement. Um, you know, there's an entire coalition called CPAT um, that is organizing different agendas for specifically for the city of San Diego. Um, you can figure out how to get involved by, you know, reaching out to them and seeing how you can volunteer. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. In addition to that, there are a ton of different uh, local officials that are running for election in November. Find out how you can, first of all, find out if you align with their agendas and what they're trying to push in our communities or what they're trying to do in order to inspire the movement. And then try to get involved with their um, organizations and their campaigns as well. And I know politics does seem a little bit, you know, kind of weird and it's sometimes really difficult to navigate. But at the end of the day, we need elected officials to represent what exactly we need in our communities, right? Um, and you know, you can begin calling your elect elected officials you, and tell them that you want them to support XYZ bill. And I will be sharing that resource um, for Creative Mornings to share uh, with all of you. Um, you can call and uh, so, uh, submit a comment uh, about different things. So there are a ton of different uh, tangible ways that um, I hope we were open and sharing um and if you have any questions of course you can reach out to us and we'll be sharing that resource um that i mentioned earlier as well somebody else on the chat just said complete the census yeah that's something you can do right now please please <laughs> complete the census. it's so important guys each of you who don't complete the census you're taking away almost two thousand dollars from your own community and it it's we're literally a dollar amount and the census is extremely important this is bringing resources back to our community and you not doing the census is taking away dollars that means we won't have resources for our youth we won't have resources for the people that are struggling we won't have all of these things for our communities so so definitely take that census. Oh, thanks for the question. So we have a couple more questions. Um, we got about four minutes until we'll wrap up. So I'm going to try to get through. Joy, uh, I'm going to unmute you and uh, let you ask your question. Oops. Sorry. Thank you, Ariel and Josh, for this amazing uh, dialogue. I have a question for you. I live in La Mesa, and I made a reach out to local officials, including the mayor of La Mesa, and he actually called me back, which I was impressed by. Um, and as I'm learning about how things work in our city, I'm distressed to learn about the difference between a general law city and a charter city. La Mesa is a general law city, and basically what I'm learning from this means that the mayor even said, my hands are tied with how the La Mesa Police Department acted. Um, and they can't do anything as a city he said sorry our hands are tied you have to deal with the police department and to me it's like wow we have this entity that comes into our city and can act however they want and we are held liable as citizens there's been cases with the la mesa police department before for paying off lawsuits and dealing with these officers but we can't do anything with our local government so i'm curious what if you have any ideas of how we can manage that or any suggestions of how i can um do yeah. about that so thank you i appreciate it one of the things a lot of cities are kind of fighting for now um is community review boards 
you know, to hold the police accountable because right now you're, you're absolutely correct where officers kind of have free reign and they're also protected by their union, which for them, it, I understand why it's so important. But then when you're on the outside in, definitely when you're financing the department yourself, it's kind of interesting that you don't have a stake in what actually how that, that goes. So um, pushing that agenda to really have a community review board that you yourself could sit on, um, your peers, uh, people from, from the community, a diverse group of people could sit in the community to review the action of the police and hold them accountable and liable. No, absolutely. And I uh, commend you for taking the initiative and in reaching out to the mayor, especially on this issue. That's a really, really important first step. Um, and, you know, letting them know that these things are, um, need to be, you know, recognized and changed. And I'm no expert in um, the way that the organization uh, of, you know, law enforcement and government kind of work, even though I work in it, I'm still learning and I'm and I'm really on the process. However, there are a lot of local community leaders that are very, very well versed in these things. Um, just to name a few, especially the black leaders in the community, Genevieve Jones-Wright. Um, we have Tasha Williamson, who has definitely been organizing and working behind the scenes with um, law enforcement uh, in La Mesa, Monica Montgomery, Montgomery. San Diego mm -hmm. uh, City Council. Um, but I would definitely, I would say reach out, try to reach out to Tasha Williamson and send her an email. She can definitely uh, put you in contact or even get you involved with some things to express uh, some of the issues that are going on with these things. And, and again, I'm sorry that I don't have a direct answer. I, I'm just not an expert quite yet. I'm still learning a lot in this journey and in this process um, and, and and that comes from you know although I've done the research it's just been a whirlwind of finding solutions because we haven't had this conversation in a really long time if ever right so you know just trying to find the different solutions but I can connect you with the right people and I apologize I don't have any more tangible uh, answers for you thank you for the question well can we just again say thank you so much to Ariel and Josh for uh, sharing their time with us today, but also spending um, just for your wisdom and also just for your um, authenticity in the conversation and dialogue. I just appreciate you both so much for um, sharing with us and for um, just your perspective. It's, it's been an unbelievably valuable uh, morning for our Creative Mornings community and um, Thank you again for uh, all that you're doing here in San Diego and for um, your work is, is, is transforming. Uh, you know, I, I've used the ripple, uh, it's the ripple effect where um, you never know how many people um, these conversations will impact over time, uh, not just locally in San Diego, but around the world. And so we just thank you again for serving uh, the community by taking time uh, this morning to share with us. And so many people are chiming in the chat saying the exact same thing. So um, with that, we're, we're wrapping, up the, uh, wrapping up the day. So just wanted to, if you guys had anything else you wanted to share, uh, Ariel and Josh just wanted to give you 20, 20 seconds or so to do so. And we're excited to uh, wrap up the day and look forward to another Creative Mornings event next month. I'll just say thank you for your time and giving us this platform to, to speak with you all. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, I think I speak for both of us when I say for, to, for having this discussion, but let's continue with it. If you have any questions, if you want to work, work, you want to partner, reach out to us. Absolutely, and I echo that sentiment. Thank you so much, Creative Mornings, for giving us this platform. We're definitely very, very grateful to you know be able to speak on these issues. And of course, I know a lot of other people had questions, so please don't hesitate to reach out to me on Instagram or any sort of thing, and I can try to connect you if I don't have the answer, but we're here and we're trying to make a difference all together in solidarity. Thanks, everybody. Well, that's it for Creative Mornings this month. Thank you so much again for joining us. Have a wonderful weekend, and we will talk to you all soon. Bye.